All right, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening um, in your specific regions. Um, my name is Kristan Herbert. I am the project officer at the Caribbean Policy Development Center. And I'm pleased that everyone is here today. I would like to thank our colleagues from MCAA. I would like to thank our colleague from CRIF SBC, our featured speakers, and the MAPS members and our participants today for being on time. Um, I would officially like to welcome you guys to Roundtable Discussion 6, Can the Livelihood Protection Policy Reduce the Impacts of um, Natural Hazards on Vulnerable Groups in the Caribbean? And we would like a very engaging discussion. We would like an interactive session today where um, participants feel free to share their comments and um, interactions with our featured speaker as well. Um, at this stage, to get us started, we'll introduce um, the officer in charge at CPDC, Mr. Richard Jones, to offer his welcoming remarks. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, as Christian said, I'm Richard Jones, officer in charge at the Caribbean Policy Development Center. Let me also welcome you this morning um, to our public forum under the project entitled Multi-Active Partnership on Climate and Disaster Risk Finance, the Context of the Insta Resilience Global Partnership. Um, this partnership is an important one for CPDC. Um, we have been engaging in this program for the last, I believe, two and a half years. <clears throat> uh, and we also believe that it is indeed an important one for us in the region. <clears throat> uh, Christian will speak a little more a little later um, on the, the program itself, the nature and extent of the initiative. Um, so I won't delve too much into that, but also would like to welcome our, our project partner, the Munich Climate Insurance Initiative, for their support of this program as we seek to improve climate resilience in the region through climate and disaster risk finance and insurance. <clears throat> We have two dynamic presenters with us this morning. I'd also like to welcome them. Ms. Elizabeth Imanu, representing CRIF SBC, and Mr. Dirk Kohler, representing MCIA and the Climate Risk Adaptation Insurance in the Caribbean Program. I'm sure they'll speak a little later on, on their organizations and their work in the region. My organization, the Caribbean Policy Development Center, is a regional umbrella body for non-governmental organizations in the Caribbean. CPDC was established in 1991 to sensitize NGOs and the general public on key policy issues and to impact public policy making within the region. <clears throat> we represent um, approximately 33 members and, and a little more than 50 uh, implementing partners across 14 Caribbean, 14 Caribbean countries. And we also provide an array of development services to the NGO sector across the Caribbean as well. Today, we will be addressing an issue of far more importance for us in the region. The region's continued exposure and vulnerability to natural hazards and the impacts of climate change on livelihoods and assets has served to collectively retard our development and threaten efforts to reduce poverty. The effects of climate change are increasingly undermining progress towards the sustainable development goals and poverty eradication in vulnerable developing countries such as ours. The Caribbean requires a real practical solution and solutions to strengthen resilience to the impact of climate change if our region is to move beyond our largely unsustainable responses to natural hazards and disasters. <clears throat> um, this is critical for us being in, in a region um, that has cyclical hurricanes and storms uh, passing through, as well as impacts from other natural hazards as well. However, I believe our presenters today will provide us with a better understanding of options for climate risk financing as we explore whether livelihoods protection policies can reduce the impact of natural hazards on vulnerable groups in the Caribbean. I look forward to these presentations and your participation as we interrogate this issue for our region, which one UN agency considers the second most vulnerable in the world. So I thank you and I look forward to your engagement over the coming two hours or so. Christian. Yeah, thank you very much, Richard, for that, um, for your welcoming remarks. At this time, I would like to offer our colleague, Dirk Coyer, the opportunity to present briefly on MCAA and their work in the region. 
Yeah, um, dear chairman, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure and honor uh, to present and to be with you uh, for this workshop. Um, my name is Dirk Kohler. I'm the insurance advisor of the Munich Climate Insurance Initiative. And I had the pleasure over years to learn more about your region and to have built very good relationships with your people. And um, I'm actively managing the project called Climate Risk Adaptation and Insurance in the Caribbean. I will talk about that later. And I would like to share my screen for only three short slides about my organization, MCII. Do you see my screen? Not as yet. Not? Not as yet. Not as yet. It's not working. Um, no, I'm... I do not get I do not get it on 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 your screen, but um, let me let me introduce it verbally, if you agree. So the Munich Climate Insurance Initiative is an uncharitable organization association um, in, uh, registered in Germany. Um, we want to develop towards being a leading think tank on climate change and insurance. And uh, we are working since 2005, especially under the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Uh, and insurance plays in these uh, negotiations an insurance role in adaptation to climate change. Our mission is to provide a forum for insurance related expertise on climate change impacts and to explore how um, we develop sustainable solutions and approaches for risk and poverty reduction in the vulnerable countries. We are governed by our executive board, the MCI executive board, um, and its membership. Um, and we have our project office located in Bonn, in Germany, um, at the United Nations University. We are part of the United Nations University. We are hosted. And uh, our members include various um, backgrounds of, of, of experts from research and academia, um, from NGOs, and especially from insurance companies, but also from the United Nations and out, out of the, um, the area of risk management and development practitioners. The, the main four, um, four pillars or the main three pillars of, of, of MCII are in the area of uh, policy governance and strategy, um, where we cooperate with international regimes such as UNFCCC uh, under the UN system, um, especially with a focus on um, developing countries and uh, emerging economies. And um, we have uh, one department uh, which is called the analytics department, which is working on improvement and implementation of conditions for financial protection mechanisms um, within a risk management approach. And um, the unit I'm part of, the team I'm part of, is the so-called Solutions and Practice Partnership team, uh, which operationalizes concrete climate risk insurance mechanisms, is researching on these mechanisms, uh, on their performance and impacts uh, on communities. And um, under this, um, special team. Uh, we are working in the Caribbean, as I said, with the, with the Craig project and in partnership, especially with our uh, friends uh, from CRIF SPC. And uh, we have a similar blueprint uh, now running as well in the, in the region of, um, of the South Pacific. This is where I come from. And again, thank you so much for the opportunity to be with you in that workshop. Back to you, Kristen. Right, thank you um, for your brief um, introduction remarks on MCIA. So to contextualize the project further, I would just do a brief presentation on the project aims, 
the goal of the project and some of the research activities that we would have done over the past two years. So as Richard would have indicated, the title of the project is the Multi-Stakeholder Partnership on Climate and Disaster Risk Financing and Preparedness in the Context of the Ensure Resilience Global Partnership. Um, the project was would have begun in March 2020, and it's approximately finishing in June 2022. And we look to kickstart our phase two efforts of this project um, later this year. So the context for the project includes, um, as we know, climate change continues to have a grave social and economic impact on the region. Um, the warming temperatures have the potential and have been impacting us by increasing the frequency and intensity of disasters in the region. And we are seeing this as a major problem, especially with the impacts of extreme weather events over the past five years. So to contextualize this more, um, we could look at some of the impacts that we would have had in the Caribbean in the last five years. So in 2017, uh, we had two hurricanes, um, Hurricane Maria, the category five hurricane, and Hurricane Irma as well. So Hurricane Maria and Dominica would have had 90% of structural damage to the region and uh, costing around USD $1.3 billion. And we, we see these impacts all the time and we feel these impacts as well. And we must start um, rebuilding better uh, for these impacts. So in Barbuda, 90% um, of the buildings were also destroyed and USD $150 million as well. We have the excessive rainfall events in Trinidad and Tobago in 2018, with approximately 80% of the country being affected. Hurricane Dorian in 2019 in Bahamas, where more than a, a thousand houses were destroyed as a result of the hurricane, and a financial cost of USD 3.4 billion. The Lucifer eruptions in 2021 in St. Vincent, where there was major uh, damages to the economic sectors a cost of USD 238 million, which would have also um, impacted neighboring countries as well as, as Barbados would have dealt with a lot of the asphalt cleanup and would have incurred some debt as well, trying to recover properly. Um, so the aim of this project is to reduce the negative impacts of disasters and climate change on vulnerable groups in selective developing countries through the use of poverty-oriented and human rights-based climate and disaster risk financing measures in the context of the Ensure Resilience Global Partnership. So the project outcomes for this project, the development of a multi-actor partnerships at the national and global levels, which promotes the development and implementation of gender-based, poverty-oriented and human rights-based approaches to climate finance. So the project outputs the establishment of a CDRFI maps in the project countries and facilitating exchanges within and amongst project countries. So in the Caribbean, we would have established the Caribbean chapter of the MAPS partnership, where we have some 38 members spanning from government, academia, um, un universities as well, private sector and civil society. And we would like to thank our partners for being here with us today. At the IGP level, um, we, we would like to promote regional policy positions and suggestions to um, impact the policy makers in the region and internationally. Also, we would like to increase the capacities of CSO partners, resulting in concrete political activities on the regional and international level. So who is implementing this project? The project has seven implementing partners from the Caribbean, the Caribbean Policy Development Center, and we have our partners in Laos, Madagascar, Malawi, Philippines, Senegal, and Sri Lanka as well. So in our region, we have three project countries, Antigua and Barbuda, Barbados and Grenada, um, who would have played a major role in the mobilization for this meeting. Um, our colleague in Antigua and Barbuda, Volunteers United in Barbados, the Barbados Association of Non-Governmental Organizations, Bango, and in Grenada, Interagency Group of Development Art Organizations, IAGDO, who would have um, engaged us and been doing all the on the ground work as well in promoting and mobilizing for this meeting and throughout the project. So who are we targeting for this project? We're targeting civil society actors in the priority countries, as I just indicated, 
and at the international level. Uh, relevant actors as potential partners in the multi-actor partnerships involved in the design and implementation of CDRFI um, solutions under the IGP at the national, regional, and global levels. So including governments, um, implementing agencies, uh, private sector, and university as well. So the indirect target group for this project is the local population. So the general public, we are seeking to engage them on um, climate and disaster risk financing and providing local mechanisms for climate and disaster risk financing to the vulnerable groups who are most impacted by these natural hazards. So over the past two years, CPDC would have implemented and completed many project activities. Um, we would have implemented the Risk Resilience Hub, which looks to provide online learning materials and resources to civil society, academia, government, and the private sector as well on CDRFI. It was sought to, um, to educate, inform, and sensitize the general public on the project and to sensitize the general public about CPDC's work in resist risk resilience. And CPDC has hosted five roundtable discussions previously. One, the introduction to the project, the integrated climate risk management in partnership with our colleagues from Sedema, um, the gender and CDRFI small scale for small scale farmers, which was a resource, a research paper um, coordinated by CPDC, the flexible hurricane protection roundtable discussion in partnership with our colleagues from Cree in Dominica, and how CDRFI benefits MSMEs, which was another piece of research conducted by CPDC as well. So we would have done many research activities. We would have done two policy magazines, three educational awareness articles, three research papers, and many videos which sought to, um, to boost the capacity of individuals around the topic of CDRFI. As we know, um, it's very new to the region and we're trying to raise public awareness as well. So to provide a greater context to what this discussion will be about today, we're looking at briefly so what is parametric insurance? So parametric insurance policies cover um, the probability of predefined events based on agreement to pay a specific sum upon the occurrence of a triggering event. So the parameter is an objective measure and the trigger in relation to the natural hazards such as the seismic levels of earthquakes, the wind speeds of hurricanes or the trigger, or the trigger for floods would be for instance, the volume of rainfall as seen in the excessive rainfall events in Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, payment is not predicated on loss or damage to assets by the insurers. So it's not based on how much you were impacted, but the predefined um, triggers that were established during the agreement. So what we will do, we will do a brief video, which will provide more context to what parametric insurance is and how it could benefit you. Just bear with me one second as I pull up the video. Hi, welcome back. Crystal here. In today's episode, we'll discuss parametric insurance. The term may be unfamiliar to many people throughout the Caribbean, so let's begin. Given the region's vulnerability to climate change and natural hazards such as hurricanes, tropical storms, earthquakes, droughts, and most recently, volcanic eruptions, various solutions for climate and disaster risk finance and insurance need to be examined. A parametric insurance policy is one that pays out based on predefined triggers or predefined conditions. When the trigger or conditions are met, the policyholder will receive the payout. Simply put, payouts can be made based on the category of hurricanes, the magnitude of earthquakes, the level of wind speed, or the amount of rain recorded. These thresholds are monitored using satellite data and other mechanisms. Due to the unpredictability of weather systems globally, Parametric insurance has played a critical role in responding to these natural hazards. 
The Caribbean has two parametric insurance products available for individuals. One provided by CRIF SPC, namely through collaboration with the Munich Climate Insurance Initiative, the ILO Impact Facility, and another by the Climate Resilience Execution Agency for Dominica, CREED. Parametric insurance offers several advantages, including payouts can be quick and timely, which speeds up the rebuild process. Based on the policy, persons already know what the payouts are for the events, and unlike traditional insurance, parametric insurance is able to cover risks the latter cannot. These products are made available for small farmers, vulnerable groups, fisher folk, and other interested individuals who have been affected by weather systems that are critical to the recovery process in the Caribbean. Are you clear on what parametric insurance is? Stay tuned for more. Don't forget to visit the Caribbean Policy Development Center's Risk Resilience Hub for more information. All right, thank you. Um, so what I want us to consider today is how do we recover from, how do we prepare for natural um, hazards in the region? How long in advance do we prepare for natural hazards? And how do we recover from natural hazards? And feel free to put your comments into the chat. I will read them for you. Or feel free to unmute and see how you recover from these disasters. Anyone want to go first? Everyone's typing. Feel free to raise your hands and I will unmute too so that we can get the discussion going. So we have Geneva saying we tend to be reactive, not how much, not much preparation. Sorry, I just lost Geneva. Right. We tend to be reactive, not much preparation. However, when there are damages, we seek recovery efforts. And thank you, Geneva. Um, Larry Tom Brown, I'm stocking up on supplies, ongoing process for myself. Uh, seeking out opportunities created by, by the hazards and utilize them. So we have Clarice with, Clarice with a question. When does a natural hazard become a natural disaster? So Ms. Evans, good you could go first and then I'll answer um, Clarice's question. Yeah, good afternoon. Is the insurance that is covered for persons who were not impacted directly. For example, um, I'm a producer and none of my crops was affected by, let's say the wind. None of my trees fell down. But lower down the road, across from me, the, the road is blocked, is damaged. My supplies waiting on me for my supplies, but their facilities, facilities are damaged. And here I am stuck with all my produce couldn't move it from my farm and my supplies damaged. Um, I was not affected directly, but indirectly. Do any way that insurance is, is a main available for people who are not affected indirectly, just as I explained. Thank you. So we don't jump too far ahead into Elizabeth and Dirt's presentation. We'll just keep that question for a bit later. If you could put it in the chat, um, I would reference it later again. Um, so we have Vanya saying that she stops up on supplies and secures buildings. Um, Clarice, I think the 
I think your question with reference to when a natural hazard becomes a natural disaster you know, speaks to the vulnerability of the region in terms of if you're not protected, if you're not insured or have the financial mechanisms in place, then it, the, the, then the um, impacts could become disastrous for you or for your family member. So we have another question. Is there such a thing as pre-existing conditions that would exclude a potential policyholder from participating and obtaining the insurance? Um, so at this stage, I see most of the questions are into the nitty gritty of the presentations either by Elizabeth or Dirk. Um, so I won't hold you back any longer. Elizabeth Emmanuel, um, the head of technical assistance and head of corporate communications at CRIF SPC, We'll just invite Elizabeth to share her screen and to provide her brief presentation on the work that CRIF is doing. Elizabeth? Thank you, Kristen. Good morning, everyone. And I'm from CRIF SBC. And a special thanks to the CPDC for inviting us this morning. Um, to present on the topic, can the livelihood protection policy reduce the impacts of natural hazards on vulnerable groups in the Caribbean? But in asking us to present on this topic, they've also asked us to spend some time speaking about the work of CRIF SBC in the Caribbean. And you would recognize from my presentation as I go through, I will touch a little bit on the natural hazard landscape in the Caribbean. The work we do with respect to parametric insurance, in fact, we, we were established to bring parametric insurance to the Caribbean and make it available, not initially for individuals, but for governments. And I will explain how the work that we do with governments also trickle down to individuals. But I'll also explain our work within the context of microinsurance, which is where the conversation started this morning, and how we are working with organizations such as the Climate Insurance Initiative to make available microinsurance products to persons in the Caribbean, including vulnerable groups. So I will now share my screen and begin my presentation. Um, okay, so I don't have to stop it. So, I'll begin by speaking about just the natural hazard landscape in the Caribbean and what we know about the story of natural hazards and their impacts in the Caribbean. I mean, it's well known. In the Caribbean and Central America, we also know that the frequency of hazards and disasters are increasing. And we also know that mortality from these disasters seem to be decreasing. But one of the things we also know is that economic costs are rising significantly. The Caribbean is defined as one of the most disaster prone regions in the world. But I think what I want to also point out as well is that there are several other disasters that we are, sorry, hazards that we are exposed to in the Caribbean. So beyond these natural hazards, um, you know, related to meteorological hazards or geohazards such as earthquakes and volcanoes and environmental hazards were also impacted by man-made hazards and other biological and health-related hazards, which really speaks to the sort of the multi-hazard environment in which we exist. Um, and these are exacerbated by other conditions in which we, we exist. We're small islands and most of our people are concentrated within one to five kilom kilometers of the coastline. For most of our countries, more than 80% of our infrastructure is located on that coastline. If you begin to think about tourism, for example, 
further increasing the vulnerabilities that we are exposed to in the region. So when we think about earlier today, Kristen, um, he put a slide on the impacts of some of these disasters on the Caribbean. And hurricanes such as Ivan, Maria, Matthew, have had devastating impacts on Caribbean countries. We are highly exposed, as the slide here shows, and they have resulted in significant economic loss. In fact, Dominica stands out as a quite a unique example because in 20, 2015, sorry, they were impacted by tropical storm Erica, which cost them 96% of their gross domestic product. Two years later, they were impacted by um, Hurricane Maria, which cost them 226% of their GDP. What we're seeing is that for the last, between 2000 and 2019, we have been impacted in Latin America and the Caribbean with 330 storms an average of 17 hurricanes per year and 23 category five hurricanes between 2009 and 2019. The hurricane season of 2017, which many of you or many of us will not forget, um, with hurricanes Irma and Maria, two cat five hurricanes within two weeks of each other is the third worst on record in terms of the number of disasters and countries affected as a result of the magnitude of those two events. And of course, just two, three years ago, um, we had Hurricane Dorian in the Bahamas, and it was the strongest Atlantic hurricane in record to directly impact a landmass. And we know what happened on the islands of Babaco and Grand Bahama. But what do these storms result in? They result in higher deficits. They, they prevent governments from undoing what they would normally have been doing with respect to um, social development or having resources for education or healthcare because these disasters cause countries to have to move resources into dealing with the impacts of the disaster, often moving already programmed resources for areas such as health, education, youth development, et cetera, into um, disasters or supporting recovery processes. They have negative impacts on industries such as tourism and agriculture. And we see year on year the impacts, for example, on agriculture and the impacts on people, on farmers, increasing poverty levels, and of course, negative impacts on economic growth. And if we throw the SDGs into that equation, what we're seeing is that it's pushing us further away from achieving the sustainable development goals. So if left unchecked, the, the economic impacts of disasters can create or generate larger losses that disrupt the long-term growth trajectories of countries. We can compare, for example, these natural disasters to financial crises. Both are exogenous events that represent covariate shocks across a country and across households. Economic damages from natural disasters jeopardize the health of national economies at a level comparable or greater than financial crises. So we have heard of you know, global financial crises and we see the impacts on our economies. But natural disasters do something more than financial crises. They destroy human and physical capital stocks of countries, something that these financial crises do not. So we spoke a little bit about the disasters increasing, the cost of disasters increasing, et cetera. What this calls for is a greater focus on comprehensive disaster risk management. And when we think of comprehensive disaster risk management, we need to look at the five pillars of comprehensive disaster risk management. So we need to know our risks. We need to be able to identify them. We need to have hazard maps in place. We need to we need to have actions or undertake activities that would, re that would reduce our risk. There, there is this pillar referred to as financial protection. And oftentimes when we hear about discussions around disaster risk management, this seems to be the pillar that is oftentimes missing 
how do we prepare and plan for disasters? What are the costs of these disasters and how do we plan for them before they happen? Then there is preparedness and recovery and redevelopment. So the focus of my presentation will be on financial protection. All right. How do we, and this whole notion that you have been hearing um, banded about um, in recent years, this whole notion of disaster risk financing. All right. What is disaster risk financing? And looking at the relationship between disaster risk financing, climate risk insurance, and climate risk, climate change adaptation. So we're going to spend a little bit of time on that this morning. So when we talk about financial protection and we talk about disaster risk financing, in short, it's really about linking our fiscal policies with disaster risk management. So it's about, in layman's terms, really ensuring that our ministries of finance allocate resources for disasters if they occur. And why do they want to do that? They want to do that so that if a disaster does happen, they reduce the budget volatility in the country. All right? They reduce the impact. They reduce the, the need to secure loans. Oftentimes in our countries or after disasters, we hear about countries receiving debt relief. Debt relief is not a grant. Debt relief is a loan which adds, or loans which you are able to get faster or easier after a natural disaster that you may not have been able to get otherwise for other developmental projects. But in the face of these crises, you're able to draw down on some resources through a loan. But this adds to the country's existing debt stock pushing countries deeper into developmental crises. So the idea is how do we invest in disasters before they happen? So we're gonna do everything. We're gonna um, put in place programs and projects for risk reduction. We're gonna look at our risk maps. We're gonna look at our risk profiles, but then is there a portion, is there a possibility that we can be impacted by a natural hazard and with all that we have done, there is still a cost. So how do we put aside those resources in the event of a disaster to not rock our budgets to the extent that we may have to look externally for funding? One of the other things that has come out as well, I mean, if we go back to Haiti in 2010, pledges that were made then have still not been received by the government of Haiti. I think maybe even six months after the, um, the earthquake in 2010, most of the resources that they received would have come from my organization, CRIF SPC, which provides parametric insurance. And I'll go into that in a little more, more, more detail. So the idea is to focus on financial protection and to link our fiscal policy with disaster risk management. All right, and it's becoming more commonplace for governments to consider the inclusion of disaster risk in fiscal policy to provide ways or more efficient means for countries to financially protect themselves against events that cannot be prevented. So there are several disaster risk financing instruments available to governments several instruments such as, and these instruments, for example, cover different types of events and focuses on different levels of intensity. So the figure that's before you shows the different types of events that we can be exposed to. Um, so we may be exposed to local floods, we have minor earthquakes, and we also have high intensity earthquakes, high intensity storms, and hurricanes. And aligned to each of these are the, the best types of financial instruments to manage these disasters. So at a very low level, when we're talking about local flooding, landslides, flash flooding, we may want to focus, for example, governments may have in place 
national reserves or dedicated reserve funds or just annual budget allocations. But as we get to the more severe events, right, which usually has a lower probability of occurrence, when we're talking about these cat five hurricanes, the instruments that governments may, may look at would be things like insurance. And parametric insurance is an example of what governments would um, purchase to deal with these high, the, the severe events and, and with low probability. So we have parametric insurance. There is also indemnity insurance, which is regular insurance that they can purchase for infrastructure, et cetera. But we all know that with indemnity insurance, we can look at indemnity insurance as we look at the cars that we have. Um, it takes time for those payouts to come from the insurance company because of the need to do assessments on the ground, right? Parametric insurance, as you saw in the video, is a little different from, or very different from indemnity insurance. So let me go a little bit to CRIP and who we are. So we were formerly the Caribbean Catastrophe Risk Insurance Facility. Now we're referred simply as CRIP SBC. So that is our, our legal name is now CRIP SBC. We are segregated portfolio company. Our name had to be changed um, in about 2014 when we began to allow countries in Central America, where we created the mechanisms to allow countries in Central America and in other parts of the world to become members of CRIP. So we moved to and a segregated portfolio company also allows us to develop several new products um, for several periods. So let me go a little bit into CRIP and how we got started. So following Hurricane Ivan in 2004, an event that I think many of us still remember, CARICOM heads of government approached the World Bank for assistance to design and implement a cost-effective risk financing program for member governments. Because at that time, following Hurricane Ivan, you recall that several countries were impacted we were short on cash in the Caribbean. And there is a recognition that following a natural hazard event, there is need for quick liquidity. There is need for cash. So is there a mechanism that could be established to provide cash to Caribbean governments in the shortest period of time? And this led to what we, have, what, what, what we now know as CRIP SBC. At that time, it marked the beginning of the Caribbean Catastrophe Risk Insurance Facility, as I said before, which is now CRIP SBC. We are the world's first multi-country, multi-peril risk pool providing parametric insurance. Why was parametric insurance decided or determined to be the instrument that we would provide? The selection of the parametric insurance instrument as a basis for CRIP and the policies that we provide was largely driven by the fact that parametric insurance is generally less expensive than the equivalent traditional indemnity insurance that we know, as it does not. And the reason for this is that it does not require a loss assessment procedure after the disaster. And as, as a result of that, we're able to settle payments quickly and in the case of CRIP, once a country's policy or government's policy is triggered, payments are made within 14 days of the event. And this is a key feature of CRIP and given the need for quick liquidity after a natural disaster. So we are a regional catastrophe fund for Caribbean and Central American governments to limit the financial impact of devastating hurricanes, earthquakes, excess rainfall events by quickly providing liquidity when a policy is triggered. For example, in the case of several countries after natural disasters, whilst we provide payments within 14 days of an event, um, there are several countries who need resources even before those 14 days. And we do, we are able in the case of a tropical cyclone within 24 hours to determine 
how how much if the policy was triggered one the, the level of the payout two how much it is it usually takes us about two weeks to go back rerun the model make sure we did the right thing there is an auditing process in place to verify that an external auditing process to verify that our calculations were correct what we did was correct etc but it's usually not off the mark and therefore for several countries, we have provided them with at least 50% of their payout even before those 14 days. So we have the example of Dorian, for example, within five days of the event, we provided them with 45% of their payout to begin immediate recovery needs. In the case of Thomas in, in St. Lucia in 2010, and in the disruption to their water supply and the breakdown of their main water treatment plant we were able to provide them with 50% of their payout to begin the rehabilitation of that major water tree, water, water, I think plant that was a that that of course was a feeder to all other water plants on the island. And of course, we know the, the link and the relationships between water and disease following a natural disaster. At CRIP, we are a development insurance company. So we are an insurance company and to stay afloat, we have strategies that allow us an investment to, to make profits. As an insurance company, we call those surpluses. But the surpluses that we make go back into our members. So as a development insurance company, we're not um, giving that profit or that surplus that we make to shareholders, but it goes back to our members in the form of reducing the cost of premiums on one hand, as well as developing technical assistance programs to support communities, people, governments in our, in our member countries, in the areas of disaster risk management and climate change adaptation. So the products that we provide, we offer five parametric insurance products. The truck for earthquakes, tropical cyclones, excess rainfall. We, in 2019, we launched a product for the fisheries sector, and this was the first of its kind anywhere in the world to support the fishery sector and vulnerable fisher folk. And we recently launched a product in 2020, uh, the electric utilities policy that targets um, transmission and distribution. So one of the things that we're able to do with parametric insurance as well is to provide cover for sectors or that are that will not normally be able to access regular indemnity insurance. So in the case of electric utility companies, the generation plants, they do have indemnity insurance for generation. But the ability to access that same type of insurance for lines and poles, overhead lines and poles, is prohibited. All right. So oftentimes, when we do have an event and those poles and lines go down, the cost to recover, whilst they may have, for example, you know, several companies say they have self-insurance funds, one within one disaster that is wiped out. And then the cost of trying to build back that fund translate into the bills of consumers in many countries. So these are our five products. Our earthquake policy is based on losses due to ground shaking, tropical cyclone based on losses due to wind and storm surge, excess rainfall based on losses due to the amount of rainfall, and for coasts, which is what we call our fisheries policy, based on losses in the fishery sector due to wave, rain waves and storm surge. And of course, electric utilities due to losses based on wind. Um, our policies, let me touch a little bit. I know we had that video on parametric insurance and what I'm gonna say here is not dissimilar to what um, you would have heard earlier. So parametric insurance, unlike indemnity insurance, our parametric insurance products at CRIP are really insurance contracts 
that makes payments based on the intensity of an event, for example, the hurricane wind speed, earthquake intensity, and the amount of loss that is calculated in a pre-agreed model caused by these events. So because of this, it enables payouts to be very quick, and it really represents a cost-effective way to pre-finance short-term liquidity or access to short-term liquidity to begin recovery efforts for a government after a natural disaster. Okay, we can make payouts of up to 150 million US dollars per peril for each country, right? So just to recap, when we speak about parametric insurance, it covers the probability of a predefined predefined event actually happening, such as a major hurricane or earthquake, instead of indemnifying actual loss incurred and pays according to that predefined scheme. Okay, so as a country, you determine the probability of an, of an event occurring. And if that event, event actually occurs, based on what you would have purchased from us, there is a that there is a likelihood of a payout. So if what we do is that we ensure a policyholder or a government against the occurrence of a specific event by paying a set amount based on the magnitude of the event as opposed to the magnitude of the loss, right? Which is what the traditional indemnity insurance product does because it has to, and that is why it has to go on the ground and actually determine the losses on the ground. So we are able to make a payment upon the, occur the occurrence of this triggering event, right? And this is therefore detached from a specific, the damage to a specific asset or the damage to a specific, say, um, farm, right? Or a specific piece of interest infrastructure. And of course, as I said before, we make payments based on the intensity of this event. So of course, we have several risk models that underpin these policies that we sell or these products, and they are considered very innovative and fit for purpose. And of course, as new data becomes available, so following the hurricanes in 2017, 20, in 2017, Irma and Maria, for example, we did go through a process of updating our models to capture these new type, these new events. So we do possess a wealth of experience, a wealth of knowledge as a facility, a wealth of data, and this allows us to develop new products um, for additional perils and sectors. Today, in 2007, when we were established, so following Hurricane Ivan, we were established three years um, after in 2007, where we actually started with 16 member governments. Today we have 23 members, seven more than the original 16 that joined in 2007, 2007, sorry. We now have three members from Central America and it is expected that we should be, several new members from Central America should come on starting this policy year for us, our year starts on June 1. So we have three members from Central America, 19 from the Caribbean, and we currently have one electric utility company in the Caribbean, which is Anglet, the Anguilla Electric Utility Company. We are in discussions with several other utility companies in the region who have expressed, that have expressed interest to procure the electric utility product. Um, so, as I said before, we have demonstrated that catastrophe risk insurance can provide a level of financial protection for countries vulnerable to natural disasters. Since 2007, we have made 54 payouts, totaling US dollars 245 million to 16 of our member governments. Now, I want to pause here a second to remind you that CRIP was never set up to cover all the losses on the ground from a natural disaster. So we view our payouts as relatively small um, compared to the overwhelming cost of rebuilding. Notwithstanding that, 
all our recipient governments have actually expressed appreciation for the rapid infusion of liquidity, which they are able to use to address their immediate priorities post-disaster. And you see that pie chart on the screen, which is showing that 63% of payouts made by CRIP go to immediate post-event activities. About 19% long-term infrastructure work. So following Hurricane Irma, the TCI, for example, used most of their payouts, which was about 20 million US dollars, to build back better the infrastructure for schools. Most of their schools were damaged as a result of Irma. There is also support to economic sectors. For example, following Hurricane Matthew, St. Lucia had a payout of about three point something million US dollars that they went, they put directly into the agricultural sector to support farmers. Um, we also have funds that go into things like risk mitigation activities to reduce future vulnerability. Um, and I think another good example that we've had is Anguilla following Irma as well, in which most of their payout went to the tourism sector. And oftentimes persons ask, why would they have invested in the tourism sector? And we're talking September of a year that you're hit by this devastating hurricane and you have a winter tourist season starting three months in December. How do you ensure that your hoteliers can recover fast enough to have those tourists come in? And when we think of tourism, we're also thinking of jobs. If our tourism sector is closed, or tourist, the, the operators, the, the tourist operators, they will find other countries to send those tourists to. How do we ensure that those tourists come? So in that case, before the indemnity insurance scheme, they chose to support their tourism sector. Our largest payout was 40 million US dollars just last year in um, August to Haiti following the, the earthquake in, 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 in that country. So this is just a snapshot of the, this is just a snapshot of the CRIP products or current products and products that are in development by CRIP. So for example, we have recently developed a drought product for the Caribbean and that product um, is currently under review. Um, we are in the process of developing a runoff model for some of our, our larger Caribbean countries, for example, Guyana and Suriname, who are not yet members of CRIP simply because they require a flood related model. Again, this is a model that has that, you know, they, our Central American governments um, would have a lot of interest in because of the notion of international water in the, in the sense that um, rivers in one country oftentimes impact other countries. So we do have situations like Belize, for example, where there is no rain in Belize and because of a neighboring country and rain in that country and flooding in that country, you would have communities in Belize being flooded. So this product aims to cover that. We're also looking at pro products for agriculture, for the agricultural sector, which, we are, which is currently in development and we're actually working with the World Bank on a product for the housing sector. And the pilot for that would be, it, it's Dominica. So we're working with the government of Dominica and the World Bank and to, put in, to, to have this product. Governments have also expressed interest for parametric insurance for several government buildings, which of course are not insured. So like hospitals, schools, et cetera. So we are working to we're looking at the perils that our countries are exposed to. We're looking at the demands and the express interests of governments. Our post product for fisheries, which I'll go into a little bit, because whilst it is a sovereign level product, like our other products, it has micro insurance components because it is specifically designed to support the fisheries sector. Oh, fisher food, not fisher food. Um, so I'll move on here. So, as I said before, CRIP 
was not set up to cover all lost losses on the ground, right? Um, and what we do must not be seen in isolation from other disaster risk financing tools that I alluded to before. For example, we have things like dedicated reserve funds, we have contingent credit facilities, et cetera. But what we need to focus on is where do these instruments fit in in, you know, in that um, in the phases of post-disaster funding needs. And we start off with relief, we have recovery, we have reconstruction, and fit and CRIP fits right there in that first part of recovery. Okay. Um, so as I said before, we're not designed to cover all losses on the ground, but to provide quick liquidity once a policy is triggered. So I will now turn to um, parametric insurance options available directly to vulnerable populations and share with you two products that we are involved in and how we're linking macro and micro insurance mechanisms. So two main products available in the Caribbean that are supported and or developed by CRIP. We have, for example, our micro insurance type product developed for fishers under the COAST project with support from governments in the region. And then we are now in the process of leading the transition phase of the climate risk adaptation and insurance in the Caribbean project, the CRAE project. And of course, under that project, the livelihood protection policy um, was produced. I will not go into much detail on the LPP, but more so the role that Crip is playing um, with respect to the livelihood protection policy and what we intend to achieve um, with that. Um, so microinsurance is key in, in supporting vulnerable populations following natural disasters. And when we speak about microinsurance, we're really referring to insurance services offered primarily to clients with low income and limited access to mainstream insurance services and other means of coping with risk. Okay, I mentioned before that we have these two instruments that we are working with. So what these insurance instruments do is that they provide protection for low income persons against specific perils in exchange for premium payments proportionate to the likelihood of the, and cost of the risk involved. And we looked at parametric insurance at the sovereign level, and it applies right here. Now, today microinsurance is recognized as a means of financial security to enable low-income families, people, communities to access insurance against natural disasters and other exogenous shocks. In fact, Microinsurance can be considered as a key component in a country's financial inclusion strap policy program. Um, it's an effective risk transfer mechanism and an integral part of a country's disaster risk management policy and strategy. More and more today, we're seeing microinsurance being incorporated into social protection policies to improve the shock responsiveness of those policies. So whilst oftentimes we say micro, yes, it helps vulnerable people and it allows vulnerable people and groups to access insurance, more and more there is recognition of the significant roles that governments can play with respect to microinsurance. On one hand, as part of financial inclusion, and on the other hand, to make their social protection policies more shock responsive. In other words, should governments participate in, for example, purchasing policies such as the livelihood protection policy so that in the event of a, of a disaster happening, they can utilize those resources specifically for vulnerable groups that may have been impacted. So outside of a CRIP payout, which when a country gets a CRIP payout, it's using it to play a role and you know, put in place Bailey Bridges or um, 
you know, deal with specific pieces of infrastructure that was significantly damaged, where can a government within its social protection or social development ministry agree to utilize microinsurance if there is a payout, that payout goes directly to those persons in the country that is most, or that has been most impacted by that natural hazard. But who are our vulnerable groups? Um, we speak a lot, I mean, we, you know, in, in the Caribbean, there are several vulnerable groups that these microinsurance products can support. So we're looking, for example, you know, it's easy, we often say fishermen and we say farmers, but we have the market vendors, we have the food vendors, we have, and in countries like Trinidad, I mean, we have the doubles vendors, we have the MSMEs, you know, the micro and small businesses that are significantly impacted by, by events. The little restaurants, the, the, the little shops, the um, seasonal tourism workers. We often forget that many persons that do work in the tourism sector in the Caribbean are not, they are seasonal workers. They only work for a specific period, usually in the high season. And as a result, if there is an event in that season, they are significantly impacted. If the hotel is impacted, they go home if the hotel is closed because they are not permanent staff. So there are several groups that are vulnerable um, that microinsurance mechanisms can support. So I'd like to touch a little bit on our product called Coast. It's a parametric insurance product that is designed to provide quick payouts to support the livelihoods of fisher folk. And when we say fisher folk in this case, we mean fishermen, boat boys, market vendors. Many of our market vendors and managers of our cooperatives are women. Um, in the Caribbean, women play a significant role in the fishery sector, and they're oftentimes not valued in the sector. Coast looks at the whole notion of women's economic empowerment and in ensuring that this product is made available. Not the product itself, but payouts on the course is also made available to um, women. And to do that, for example, for post product, we had to identify several, in, in the two countries that we now provide, post St. Lucia and Grenada, to identify the role that women played and to also ensure that they are listed as fisher folk, because oftentimes when we think of registration of fisher folk, we think of registering simply the fishermen. But what about the women who are a significant part of that sector? A coast product is a sovereign parametric insurance product in that it is purchased by the government of a country, but it contains micro insurance elements as payouts go directly to fisher folk. And this is what is unique about Coast. So it's a parametric product. It means if a Coast policy is triggered, the government will get a payout within 14 days of that event. But it's not the government's money. That money then has to be filtered to um, the fisher folk. So within two weeks of receiving the payout, those monies will go to fisher folk. And it's an intricate process of identifying fisher folk, which is done prior to the event. We make ch changes are made to those lists on a monthly basis to add people. I mean, it's a whole process that we have to, in, you know, to, to clean those lists, to ensure that we didn't have persons who know, you know, who are no longer alive, etc. But to clean those lists and have those lists always ready in the event of a payout. So course encourages inclusiveness, as I said before, and participation of women, and will provide payouts to many women who contribute to the fishing industry as managers and as managers of the fish markets and as vendors. We see course as a highly innovative product as it links sovereign level insurance with social protection strategies, and of course, it directly supports fisher folk and others working in the fisheries sector. Um, so just a little more here on coast. 
Um, one of the other things about codes is that we have designed codes to support the development of strategies to ensure that re marine resources are managed and used in sustainable ways. So we are looking at projects and programs that will support, for example, the ecosystems such as coral reefs on which the fishery sector is based. Because we acknowledge and COAST acknowledges that we must pay closer attention to the goods and services provided by the marine environment. And um, so focusing, of course, on things like shoreline protection, et cetera. As I mentioned before, another product that CRIP is playing a leadership role in is making available to our Caribbean member governments the livelihood protection policy. And before I turn over to Dirk, let me say in a few words, a, a few words on the CREAT project or the climate risk adaptation and insurance in the Caribbean project and our role at CRIF in collaboration with MCI and other partners. We are currently leading this transition phase of the project and working towards providing this product to the, protect the most vulnerable populations, farmers, fishers, market vendors, street food vendors, day laborers, construction workers, persons in the tourism sector against climate related shocks. Similar to CRIP other products, the LPP is designed to provide these cash payouts following extreme weather events to sustain the livelihoods of people. But what I'd like to point out here is that in our role under the, the project, we will be looking at involving several stakeholders, looking at governments, as I said before, not just as the regulator to, to approve the product, but we're going to be, we are working closely with governments to look at LPP as part of financial inclusion, to look at LPP as part of um, social protection strategy. We're working closely with our partner, the Guardian Insurance Group, um, to, to, to ensure that they are able to interact as well with that fisherman, with that farmer. How do we build their capacity to do that? So we see this product as key to advancing financial inclusion targets in countries, as well as playing a key role in social protection, and of course, improving the shock responsiveness of social protection policies. As I close, one of the things, so in short, just to answer the question that I was posed, yes, LPP can reduce the impacts of natural hazards on vulnerable groups in the Caribbean by protecting their livelihoods. And as I said before, Dirk will go on to speak a little more about the LPP itself. And in closing, what I want to say is that it is clear that the absence of insurance will have negative consequences for the scale and duration of the economic impacts of disaster. The importance of catastrophe risk insurance, um, such as what CRIP offers in the face of a change in climate, cannot be underscored, and it is supported by the UN. UNFCCC, the G7 leaders, the Paris agreements, and, have, and they have all established that parametric insurance is an acceptable climate adaptation instrument. So in closing, I would just like to say the, the organization that I'm from, just to capture, we are about providing quick liquidity. We are about allowing governments to support the most vulnerable in their population immediately after natural disaster. Just remember that pie chart that you saw and how payouts were used, um, reducing budget volatility, not increasing significantly the debt, not increasing the debt stock of countries. Parametric insurance will not result in an increase in debt stock because you pay for your insurance and that's it. We offer diverse products for both a range of perils and economic sectors, and we offer products that are not readily available in traditional insurance markets. So thank you. Continue to engage with us and learn more about what we do. And I think I can turn over to you. Well, thank you, Elizabeth, for that comprehensive presentation. And we are seeing in the chat some of the real life effects of um, natural disasters and natural hazards on persons. And I know Dirk is very passionate about um, providing the help to the vulnerable populations of this region. So at this stage, I would just hand over to our colleague Dirk to give us a brief presentation on the LPP. 
Yeah, thank you very much. And um, I, I would say thank you so much, Liz, for um, your very comprehensive introduction and uh, very impressive. Um, it, it makes me a little bit proud that we are partnering <laughs> and that we are going together the way um, for a sustainable transition of what has been done in the last years. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, the LPP, the livelihood protection policy, and it was well explained in the video and it was well explained uh, during the other presentation, um, it is a new animal. It is a new animal in the insurance industry. In former times, the insurance industry was, was paying indemnity insurance. This means you, had a, you have a loss, you have to prove your loss, and uh, when you have proven your loss, you get indemnification. My first lesson learned of parametric is out of the technical mechanism that I will come to, we can pay out quick. And this is exactly the situation in, um, in a region such as the Caribbean, where the, the financial need after a disaster is immediate. And it is not a process of three months that you can discuss um, um, about uh, the, 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 the loss you, you have um, encountered. Parametric is paying out quickly because it is using new technology. It is using uh, satellite data and satellite observation and monitoring. But already there, and this is a lesson learned, um, already there, the data that comes out of these satellite observations is crucial for the definition of the product itself. And so when I have taken over um, the responsibility for the climate risk adaptation and insurance in the Caribbean project, we had a data set. I will not go into the details, but we had a, a, an old data set called TRIM. And it was, it was not the accuracy, accuracy that is needed to avoid what we call under parametric insurance, the so-called basis risk. This is the risk that you are, you believe that we are well looking at you from the satellite perspective and we are well defining um, the area in which um, the, the wind event or the excess rainfall event has happened. And so um, the data set is very important. We have changed that. We, much better data becomes more and more available as parametric insurance is developing and as um, new satellites are launched. So this is also, and I'm coming to the, the, the red line of these, of, of these pro, uh, lessons learned. Um, this was also a problem to identify insurance companies because they are business that accept the data set, which is underlying an insurance product that is paying out quickly, that an insurance product that is uh, uh, available at a micro level. And um, so we, we had also the challenge um, to convince companies, insurance companies, to go into this market and to, to ask for regulation, to discuss with the regulators and to um, and we, we had to develop even um, the, 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 in, in, in some countries, we had to, to develop the, the regulatory environment because it was not existing. And so um, it must be, first of all, affordable to the people that we want to protect. And we want to protect lowest income and the poor. And this is the challenge that, that Liz has very well explained. It must be really affordable and we must target the poor. And this is uh, one important lesson we had. It was designed as a micro insurance product. Yes, that's fine. Micro means it can be micro in premium. It can be my, micro in insured amount. That's all good. Um, but in any way, insurance stays a concept. And, and this is why it was uh, retained by the G7 in 2015, insurance is a concept where somebody has to pay his premium to get the security of a legal binding environment, a legal binding contract, so that he gets indemnification. And so we have tried this um, 
and developed this in Jamaica and San Lucia first and in, Gren in Grenada as well. And um, at, at the, in the first phase, it was uh, developed with JK Insurance Group. And JK Insurance Group today has, has um, a, a renamed um, product that they are calling the Weather Protect. That's fine. Uh, so they are they are still in this in this space. We have we have now a new partner, which is Guardian Insurance, in our program, um, and um, we are still having this working title, Lifelong Protection Policy, the LPP, because it becomes to be known uh, in our region uh, more and more. But I want to come back to the affordability because it's crucial. Um, if we if we offer this product, the pricing is very high because the insurers are looking at the technical risk. And if you calculate the technical risk for one, whatever currency for one, you have a 5% risk that it happens each year on wind, extreme wind. You have a 5% risk of excess rainfall on one unit. So if you, if you take this as a technical risk and the monetary, um, type of exp uh, the monetary type of definition of the risk, then insurance industry sets on top distribution cost, admin cost, margin. Then there is a reinsurer behind because direct insurers in the region also need reinsurance, the insurer of the insurer capacity. And so it becomes more and more expensive. And what we want to, 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 to the, develop further is breaking this, um, this dilemma of this high cost for, and to, to make it affordable without leaving nobody behind. That's, that's the important um, development um, of, of the last years. And so microinsurance is fine. Microinsurance has a certain target group where, where, we, where, where it, it is available, it is affordable. We, we still must integrate in all these target groups, risk prevention and financial literacy measures, but we must think further micro. And we have thought further in the first instance by regrouping clients for insurance companies, what we call the meso level, the group level. This is what Liz has, has explained in a sense of a target group, the fishermen at, in the coast program. We, we are saying a group level is, for example, a cooperative. So you do not insure the individual member. The individual member is a beneficiary of the livelihood protection policy, but the insured is the cooperative itself. This works also for farmers and other groups that are organized in a cooperative manner or in a group manner. And so we have passed from pure micro to micro and meso. And this was also in the presentation um, list presented. Um, the next level is how to get the macro level, the governmental level, the sovereign level down to the micro level and including the poor with what type of mechanisms. That's a lesson learned we had as well. We must work on this macro to micro approach, including um, the poor. So how, how, how does all this fit together and, and what, what has it needed to come to that point where we are today in the successful start of a transition into the regional operator carrier, which is CRIF SPC? It needs a donor. We have been supported by the German environmental ministry. It needs the right partnerships. We have CRIF, CRIF SPC and still CRIF SPC as the, as the major implementation partner. We have the ILO, the International Labour Organization, a sister organization from, from our university. We have a modeler who is designing and, and acting all around these data and finding better data, quicker data, and less costly data. We are thinking um, about um, digitalization. We are, but it must be again, affordable, practical, and it must, it must be 
new technology that is reliable also in um, in, in in extreme situations such as natural um, disasters. So experience Jamaica, San Lucia, we had um, a nice little insurance portfolio um, where we had um, individuals that have purchased the insurance directly. We had these first group contracts and we have decided that this is the, 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 the way forward. And um, we had payouts and we had correct payouts, but we had also wrong payouts. This means that this, 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 this basis risk of parametric insurance, this means that your satellite is not capturing exactly the, the region in which you are insured, which can always happen. Um, this we have reduced now by better data and a new data set. And so we have faced also the misunderstanding of clients, or, or let's, let's put it the other way around, the misexplanation of insurance companies towards their clients when they are asking what is insured. For example, I remember in, in San Lucia, there was um, a banana farmer uh, that was claiming, even at ministerial level, um, that he is insured and the insurer is not paying out. The problem was the, 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 the value of the insurance, the trigger value of the insurance contract was not designed for the vulnerability of his banana plantation. A coconut farmer would not have had a problem because the vulnerability of coconut trees is totally different to bananas. And so he was claiming, and, and, and we had to face a, a long discussion um, with, with the Ministry of Agriculture about that, and to explain that we need also financial literacy and we need education in the market. It's, it's, it is not enough just to license or regulate these type of insurance solutions, but we must also educate the clients, the future clients, and the people. We had we had nice, real nice experience also with payouts in 72 hours. It, it is feasible. It is feasible. It, for the moment, it is not regulated for 72 hours. It's regulated for 40 days, payout after the event. That's that's the legal um, the, 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 the legal maximum. Um, but it is feasible in 72 hours. If you are sitting in front of your if, of, of your monitoring system, you know who is um, um, who is um, um, under um, under threat by um, the natural natural disaster. I believe that the the, the phase we are now starting the trans, so-called tran transition phase of of the climate risk adaptation and insurance in the Caribbean project. Um, is a big opportunity because um, there are the, the market has developed. There are a lot of insurance companies that are interested in this in this new market. It is also a market entry for insurance companies in a new um, group in a, in a new target group, a target group that is developing, and perhaps today micro, but tomorrow you have more. And so it is, a, it is an entrance door to new clients. And so we feel that the insurance industry is coming up, is coming with us, is developing further. The reinsurers, they have done it in, in the past, lesson learned, Jamaica and St. Lucia, they have done it some sort of, yeah, um, it is on our, on our charity list. This is not the right way. We want products, we want companies that are proud to have these products in the market, we want clients that renew each year their contract because they, they are um, confident and have built trust and understood what their insurer is offering to them and they can afford it. And we need, and this is my final comment, and we, we, we need political responsibility for this type of protection mechanisms that are available now. There is, the responsibility of governments. Chris, 
CRIF has, has, has solutions in that area. There is also an international, an international and, and multi-global country responsibility. And we call it the polluter pays principle. Thank you. And thank you, Dirk, for a very informative and passionate uh, presentation. At this stage, we will hand over to our colleague, Geneva Oliveri, who will be facilitating the question and answer section of this, um, of this event. Um, I would just like to encourage everyone, if you have any questions, to please place them in the chat. Geneva would um, read them out, or feel free to raise your hands and ask your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Kristan. Thank you very much. Well, firstly, I know that earlier, uh, Mr. Evans Gooden would have posed a question on the coverage for farmers who are affected indirectly by disaster. Perhaps we could start with that question and then we could um, receive other questions and comments from the participants. So I just, I leave it to the panel to, um, to answer that particular question. Um, good morning, everyone. This is Liz again. Um, okay, well, I'll just say very quickly that with parametric insurance products and products like the livelihood protection policy, anyone can purchase such a policy. And if it triggers, it means that your livelihood will be protected as well. So um, it, the short answer is you are able to purchase that product and in the event of a triggering event, for want of a better word, you will receive a payout as well. So in that way, your livelihood will also be protected. Thank you very much for addressing that question in a very concise manner. Thank you. I hope, um, Mr. Gooden, that you would have received the answer that you are looking for. Can we go to Byron Blake next? I see your hand up, Mr. Blake. Oh, Evans. Thank you. Thank you very much. Byron Blake here, and I'm speaking from okay. Jamaica. Yes, Ori hi, Mr. Blake. Welcome. Originally of CARICOM. Fantastic. I, I want to raise an issue which Dirk touched on but did not go into it at all as its very last point. The size of the risk and the frequency of occurrence and all of that, the, in the, certainly the climate change arena depends upon what is happening, what pollution is taking place and so forth. All right? Because if you're having 20 year occurrence, as against a five-year occurrence, <laughs> the size of the risk are just not a proportion. The, that riskiness is due to an external factor. But the insurance we are setting up has to be paid internally. And I think what Dirk was saying was, what did not want to go into it is, that there is a part of that insurance and to reduce the cost of that insurance, the part payment, which needs to come elsewhere. As a matter of fact, I think Liz did mention it in the sense that she, again, skipped over the fact, but said it, that you need donor. But donor has a connotation that you are giving me something and uh, uh, polluter pay says you have a responsibility to pay. And I think part of what has been happening over time, because that part is not happening, then we are going to the insurance, which is an important, an important sort of costly substitute to the vulnerable. Of course, if you are vulnerable, and there's nothing else. You have to go to this. But we have to go back and say, how do we re reduce the cost, the fundamental cost of the insurance? 
and to reduce the fundamental cost of the insurance, we have to reduce the frequency and the strength of the risk. We have to reduce that. And if we're not reducing it by mitigating it, then we have to pay an amount that goes towards subsidizing the insurance. Because otherwise, the final plan is picking up a burden, which quite frankly, he cannot be over time. I mean, and even when the governments come in, <laughs> the, the, when the occurrence happens, the government has a new set of expenditures. It had just built a road and it has to rebuild it. But it's left to find the money for the insurance and for the next time around. If we look at those things, we realize that they are not sustainable. And therefore, we cannot, while well, we recognize the importance of the insurance and all of these mechanisms which have to be done because you have to find a way that we have to go back also. And we cannot forget principle one, which says that payment into adaptation and mitigation and funds which are necessary by the polluter. We call, let me call the person who causes or who increases the level of the basic risk because it increases the level of the occurrence. That that fund has to be there, be a part of the cost. Otherwise, just the insurance cannot do it. And governments and the final person impactees cannot bear it over time. It's not sustainable. And I think this is something which, as we discussed, the importance of these mechanisms which are designed to help out because there's nothing else that we have to see now. How do we support those mechanisms so that everything can become sustainable over time? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Blake. Thank you very much um, for weighing in and giving us a lot to think about in terms of insurance coverage and risk. Um, Mr. Dirk Kola, would you like to weigh in at this point on anything that um, would have been mentioned by Mr. Blake before we move on? Yeah, thank you so much. Byron, that was, that, that was really full in my heart. Um, but there is, the, 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 there is no silver bullet measure to make insurance less costly. It is a very good mechanism, we, we are convinced, but it is like a puzzle. And the, this puzzle must be all measures around the, the protection that insurance is offering to lower the price. And this is what we have to do. And this means also thinking outside the box. If you are asking only the insurance companies about solutions to, to, to bring costs down, then we are talking uh, subsidy. That's the easiest and the only thing they have in mind. But there is a family of measures and this family of measures must be transparently developed and given to the whole market. That's our, our next challenge. Thank you so much for your comment. Thank you very much, Mr. Kula, for that um, very insightful um, response to Mr. Blake's um, contribution. I would then, before we go to Ms. Mar Ms. Marjorie Beza, I would like to raise, um, mention a question raised by Ms. Elijah James. Are there any scenarios where someone would be deemed ineligible to sign up, maybe a highly frequent event or area? Any one of our guest speakers could take that? Yes, hi. I mean, a quick response is that anybody will be able to purchase the LTP. There is no exclusion. There are no exclusions. Okay, so there are no exclusions, even if there's an area that is constantly being affected by, um, by natural disasters. All right, there are no exclusions. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Um, Elijah, well, we have our answer there. Yes? Hi, Geneva. Hi, thank Elijah. you for that um, question. Thank you, thank you for asking the question. I just wanted to follow up. So is, is that something that will make the fund itself sustainable, especially if you have, because I know generally the whole concept of insurance is balancing risk. Mm -hmm. So if you know for sure something is happening consistently um, and you have to consistently pay out, out of it, 
um, doesn't that eventually at some point in time make the fund or deplete the fund to a point of unsustainability? Yeah, I can I can take this one if I'm allowed to, Geneva. Yes, please proceed. Thank you. Um, we, we we still have at highest risk level, we still have some sort of portfolio diversification of risk. This means it will not hit all the regions mm -hmm. and all the people and all the portfolio that the insurer has. This is why we we have a market premium that that can be that 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 can be adopted. So it is a question of risk mm -hmm. exchange and and even thinking broader. For example, in our project, my my German government, um, I'm a German, so my government has decided five pilot countries. This makes no sense because the more countries you are dealing with, the less you have the risk that all countries are hit by the same event. And you're be better placed to know how, how hurricanes um, uh, function. And so we have a risk exchange and this makes it insurable even in the long run and even in a sustainable manner. I think uh, technically we are not facing this. We are facing the risk of probability and severity and this means the pricing. That's, that's, that's for sure. But we, we can offer it in the future. Thank you very much for that. But um, can I just ask one thing of you at this point? Could you repeat the five project countries for those persons who probably came in late or did not, was not able to hear the five project countries? Yeah, uh, sorry. Um, is my connection so bad? Um, my, my, it is, it is um, Jamaica. Miss, Miss Blake, could you just mute, could you mute your mic so that um, we wouldn't get the feedback? Thank you. Thank you. I think it's unmuted again. Thanks. Yeah, okay. okay, sorry about that. Please proceed, Mr. Kula. No, no, no problem. Um, it is Jamaica, San Lucia, Grenada, Belize, and Trinidad and Tobago. And we are, our, our, our team ambition, including our friends with CRIF, is to bring it to the whole region, to the whole Caribbean, the idea that we have developed so far. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for clarifying that for us. Um, we would now open the floor for Ms. Marjorie Beza. Ms. Beza, you could unmute and take the floor. Thank you so much. Uh, my question uh, piggybacks on what on the one from uh, Mr. James. If there are these recurring incidents, incident, I'm a recurring applicant. You know, I, I'm I'm filing um, claims repeatedly. Is there going to be the traditional spike or hike in the cost of my premiums going forward? So then affordability at that point, affordability becomes an issue. Also a bit of curiosity about how the countries were selected for the pilot. Um, I couldn't help but notice that again, it's predominantly larger islands in the Caribbean. So I'm, I'm just curious how the decision was made to select the pilot countries. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, our panelists, feel free to weigh in and, and, um, and respond. Perhaps Liz wants to come in as well and I can answer on the, on the five pilot countries. Um, let's put it that way. I, I'm with, I'm in a public space here, but um, let's put it in a, in a very open way. Um, if, if you make projects with the donor community, then um, you must accept what, what the donor wishes. And it may, it may make sense, it may make no, no sense. And um, it is true, there are, there are more exposed uh, countries to the, these type of risks when winter makes us rainfall. And there are bigger countries that would have made much easier uh, for us to convince the insurance industry. It is simply a polit politic political choice of the donor. And this is why we must make it a solution that the, that the market is driving and, and not just donor money. That's my uh, personal if I, could, if I could add to that as, as well. Um, 
One of the other things um, in terms of the larger countries like Jamaica and Trinidad, the idea was to also try to bring scale to the project because it's micro insurance. So you would want to have, to make it viable, I think it kind of goes back to Elijah's point as well. You also want to have scale. So it was about introducing it in the first instance, but also trying to look at where we have the largest amount of say farmers and fishers and food vendors. So that would bring, for example, Jamaica and vulnerable persons, Jamaica and Trinidad and Tobago in the mix. There was also a slight notion on the development of the insurance sector itself and the readiness. But the good thing is that because CRIP works in 19 Caribbean countries, the intent is for this project, this product, sorry, to be rolled out into all CRIF member countries. And one of the things that we've, we're working with the Guardian Group, so whilst the project supports the five pilot countries at this point, the Guardian Group actually operates in all of those 19 countries that are our members. And it really doesn't prevent them from as a private sector company, offering it to a country that um, has an express interest. In fact, just this week through our CRIF, our policy renewal process with countries, we've had a number of express benefits um, for, for the LPP and that we need to share with the Guardian Group. In fact, in one particular country, um, a permanent secretary actually said, well, you won't even need to do any um, marketing for this product in my country because we know vulnerability and we know the power of insurance and um, we're, we, we can be a best practice. I mean, so we are looking at other mechanisms to even roll out faster than the project itself. So. Thank you for that. And to the second part of my question, with regard to affordability, would the premium, as in traditional insurance products, would the premiums increase as the number of time you, times you would have filed claims increase? Does that make sense? So is there a, a relationship between the two? Will my, will my cost for my insurance go up because I have to file claims more frequently because I am frequently impacted by the climate climate change concerns. Can, can I take that? Yes, please proceed. Yeah, thank you. Um, no, um, the, what, 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 we, what we have developed is some sort of grid, a net that we put over a country. And in each of this, these cells, we have a certain risk. So we are calculating the probability, how, how this, the, the risk of uh, hurricane cut one, cut two, cut three can occur in this little cell. Mm -hmm. You are not judged as a person. You are not judged with, let's say, the assets that you have. You have chosen a certain amount and you say mm -hmm. this is, I, I would recommend, for example, um, if a hurricane hits, you have a three months energy down, you have a, a three weeks energy down or th and, and three weeks water down and you need money uh, because you cannot go for fishing. Right. Um, so calculate something in that range that you have an immediate short help. It, we, it will never cover the loss you had. Of never. Course. It is just a, a helping hand, a financial helping hand. And this, this financial helping hand is calculated on geographical addresses, call it addresses, mm -hmm. your address. Even if you are not on your island, but you are insured in San Lucia um, then, and, and, and some, something hits, uh, you get the money. Um, this was also a problem we had with the regulator because it could be used as a gambling product. So yeah, you are sitting in in Germany and you are looking at uh, hurricane season in the Caribbean and you are buying LP, uh, the, the life of protection policy and, and you are gambling on, 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 um, on hurricanes. This mm -hmm. is why 
the insured amount is kept. It, we have discussed with the regulator, we have said there is a maximum amount um, that is um, insurable. We have, for example, 10 units of this maximum amount that you can purchase and mm -hmm. to, make, to make it more affordable. So you get smaller units and that's the way it goes. But you, are, you have no penalty in a sense of um, what you did. This is a problem because the insurance industry would like to have an excess, as we have in indemnity uh, insurance, an excess to obligations, an excess to motivation. We must motivate in parametric insurance with, with understanding, with trust, with financial mm -hmm. literacy, with explanation, what is covered, what is not, what should I do, what can I do? Right. So there are a lot of, we call it disaster risk reduction um, measures that can be explained by the insurer that can be supported by insurers or organizations in the region. And it's a whole family of measures, but you are not, you are, you have no penalty if you have three times been hit by a hurricane. It I could see. happen, it could happen mm -hmm. that the insurer or especially the reinsurer steps back and says, for me, the risk is too high now. Mm -hmm. So this can happen in, in the, let's say, far future, because when the portfolio is growing of insureds, then the amount becomes important. For Understood. the moment, for mm -hmm. the moment um, there is enough money out there in capital markets um, to get it uh, to okay. get it secured. Thank you for that, mm -hmm. because again, when you look at things like my, my farm is located on a hillside, um, rain come, heavy rainfall, guess what? My farm is still going to be located in a, excuse me, in the same spot, the same weather patterns and whatever. And traditionally in insurance, the more that you claim, the more your policy cost goes up. So that's what triggered that particular question. Thanks so much for your thorough response. Yeah, and thank you very much for that question. It definitely has, it has me thinking now about it. I see Mr. Byron Blake, your, um, your hand is up again. Uh, we, could, we could have you for a few minutes talking and then we'll go into the question and the chat by Mr. Tyrone Lou. So Byron, you could take the floor. Thank, thank you very much. And it's really on this point about the exclusion, non-exclusion and so forth. So I want to ask, is the program reviewed after a period of time because it might be true that well it, it's true that a particular either country or farm would not be excluded but there's a program overall policy overall program which includes several countries and so so is the program reviewed reviewed or reviewable after period so that one can see the impact. I recall, for example, after Hurricane Gilbert, okay, but after Hurricane Andrew, then the insurance companies said, no, 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 no. We now have to review our policies, our whole operations, because after Gilbert, it was so and so. At Andrew, after that, we're beginning to see something else. So I'm asking whether this program, are these policies overall, whether they are reviewed after a point in time to see whether their own profitability is still there. And then if they are reviewed and the profitability is not there because the call on it by some or by all the participants is such that it has reduced it. What will happen? Um, I, I take this one. Um, again, we, we are not in indemnification insurance. We are not in the standard insurance where you are, where, where, where the insurer has a punishing jar um, for each event. Um, we are in an area where we are measuring the events. And it, 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 we have, we have uh, uh, one dilemma. We are talking, we are all talking climate change. 
But climate change is not insurable. It's a long, it's a long term uh, event um, and no insurer in the world will, in, will insure climate change. What we can ensure are climate change consequences. This means extreme weather events. And when you have a farm and you are exposed to all the risks that Liz has well, well pre uh, presented, uh, the, 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 whole, the, the whole range, it's not only wind and rain. Um, if you have specific exposure, take your parametric insurance on that exposure, you have uh, the, your, on your risk, on your individual risk at your location, and then you get the minimum payout that is helping you to overcome the famous three weeks, or sometimes it can be three months. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kula. Very insightful. I would now go to a question by Mr. Tyrone Lowe. He asks, of CRIF been embraced by private insurance company? Do they see competition? How can a group pursue the purchase of insurance for its membership? I note COAST is only in St. Lucia and Grenada. Uh, is that an indication that not all territories have embraced CRIF? For the records, I think the stream is great. All right, so I'll start from the bottom, go up. Yes, at this present moment, COAST is only in St. Lucia and Grenada, but we're actually working on make, rolling out COAST in several other countries starting this policy year, as I mentioned before, this CRIF policy year starts in June. Um, one of the things that we had wanted to do and we try to do with our members is to access funding to support premiums, et cetera, um, product development. So we recently, in December, received a grant from the Irish government to support COAST, and we'll be using that to help our member governments with the actual development of the product. So the COAST product is underpinned by our tropical cyclone, is underpinned by our tropical cyclone and our excess rainfall product. But to make it country specific, it requires um, data from countries related to the fishery sector. So we have to revise the model. The model, a unique model is prepared for each country in this case. Um, so we do have the rainfall and the wind data, but we're working on the fisheries data and so on. The World Bank has also been supporting us, supporting countries as well with the payment of premiums, etc. So just to say, it's not because the countries do not embrace it, in fact, many of we have as much as 12 countries expressing government's interest in getting the post product. So we're working on that. In terms of a group pursuing the purchase of insurance for its membership, I'm assuming that this is the LPP. But before we go into that, I'd also want to touch a little bit on coast. One of the things that we're doing with coast is, and in the case of Grenada and St. Lucia, is looking at sustainable financing mechanisms for COAST. So ensuring that, uh, you know, what are the ways in which we could fundraise um, to ensure that this product always remains a priority for government. And in meeting with stakeholders, for example, in St. Lucia and Grenada, there was expressed interest that corporatives wanted to, to actually support the payment of premiums for the coast products. So they wanted a public-private public -private partnership to support the payment of premiums. Okay, with respect to LPP, we are in the process right now of Guardian Insurance Group as our new partner with this. We're in the process right now of getting regulatory approvals for both the individual policies and the group policies. As Dirk mentioned, we'll have individual policies where you can purchase and group policies where, for example, um, and group policies where a group, whether it's a cooperative, whether it's a community, whether it's an NGO, can purchase on behalf of their members. Once we launch the actual purchasing of the policies in the five member countries, it is something that, um, you would, be easy, that, that would be easy to do. How has the presence of CRIF been embraced by private insurance companies? Well, it is embraced because what we offer 
it's not really in direct competition. It's not in direct competition with what they offer. And we have filled a gap that they have not been able to fill in terms of um, insurance for governments at a sovereign level and being able to respond to the needs of quick liquidity once a policy is triggered. And, we, and because we are a little different too, because we pool risk, right? We pool risk and we also segregate our two regions. So we don't have the commingling of risk between Central America and the Caribbean. So in pooling the risk, we're able to provide products that are even cheaper than if, for example, our governments sought to go onto the international reinsurance and capital markets themselves. The thing that we are actually, I mean, and just recently we had a training program with the banks in terms of even be able, being able to provide parametric insurance or the exploration, I should say, not, not of providing parametric insurance for bank loan portfolios, for example, because you see the impact, you could see the impact of private sector risk on the entire economy. If we have a significant event and individuals are not able to pay back their loans, you could have um, banks being significantly impacted, which in turn has an effect on the entire economy. So parametric insurance is also another way of supporting um, banks. So we have not had any conflict with the private insurance companies. And because of that as well, you would have seen where they embraced the, um, the LPP. For example, other than the Guardian Insurance Group, we've had discussions with other insurance companies who have found the idea quite innovative and other kind of distribution companies like credit unions who have found the idea of print quite innovative. And so, so in short, no, um, we have been embraced by, I mean, there, there have been issues, I mean, with anything that is new and innovative and not always fully understood. You know, so we've had issues around parametric insurance, you know, why didn't we get a payout or why did this all pay out not enough, but through building um, capacity, raising awareness around parametric insurance, around CRIP, how payouts are used, you know, just looking at our whole m &E framework in terms of requiring countries to report on the use of payouts. Initially, there was some resistance on that. You know, we're purchasing our insurance, why do we have to report? But part of it as well is that we're also heavily funded by donors as well who want to know. But even countries now are more appreciative to actually see how to actually know um, and be able to report on how their investment in CRIP has worked. So I think, I hope I answered your question. Thank you very much. I definitely learned a lot um, from your, your, your presentation. So I, I hope that the two, Mr. Tyrone Lowe, I hope that you would have gotten the answers that you were looking for um, from Ms. Emmanuel. I would like to then now, as we seek to close up the session, take a question from Mr. Kristen Herbert, and yeah. then we would get to the question by um, Ariel Laidlow, and then we would close, we, then we would close the session. Son? Right. I think in your presentation, Elizabeth, you would have um, breezed over the cost model and how the model was used as a micro insurance model. But the government played a major role in terms of the rolling out of the funds and providing the funds to the vulnerable populations as we know it. I was just wondering if any consideration was given to that model and extrapolating it to the LPP in the sense that the government could be the channel. Um, who provides support to the vulnerable populations, even if it is as minor as providing some of the um, the policies for the most vulnerable in the region. Okay, so yes, we are trying to work closely with governments because we see several roles for governments in the LPP. For example, at a very basic level, we would want to work with those governments that, for example, include GCT or VAT on insurance policies to eliminate those four vulnerable groups and insurance policies like the LPP. 
because I mean, asking them to be, um, you know, um, taxes, but other ways that we're working that I want to stress on is to work with governments to purchase what we, what, what we refer to as, um, not individual policies, but, but to purchase a set of LPP policies. So each social development ministry, for example, would receive a subvention from government. Now, part of that subvention usually involves putting aside monies for disasters and to help vulnerable people. We're saying to them, instead of just putting it aside or it remains in a bank account or you invest it in some instrument, why not utilize, if you were to get $100 for in the event that something happens to help vulnerable people, why not put aside a fifth or a third of those resources, it, why not invest that in insurance? So if you're investing $1, your payout might be $4. So you have now three to $4 to help the most vulnerable that may have been impacted by that event. So the role of governments in microinsurance, I think one of the things that this project is trying to do in the Caribbean is to sort of scale up the role under the CRAIG project of governments in insurance and how they can utilize microinsurance mechanisms to support vulnerable groups. And we, I think we did prepare a policy brief on that and we have been sharing it with governments, but as we roll out the LPP in the five countries, it is one of the areas that we will be aggressively pursuing and if I could just, with your um, permission, Geneva, to actually say, to actually respond to, use this same mechanism to respond to Ariel Laidlow's question about engaging CSOs. And definitely, this is something that we will be doing and have been doing with respect to um, microinsurance products, to the LPP, to, um, and even with COAST, just working with groups to understand. In the case of COAST, while they're not even purchasing the policy themselves, knowing that if you register as a fisher folk, this is the benefit you can get. Knowing what the product is about, knowing the link between these products and protecting their livelihoods, for example. So yes, we will be working and we have been working with um, civil society organizations, we have been working with NGOs. In fact, one of the things that we actually want to do on the CRIP, we do have a small grants program in which we support communities and NGOs and CSOs. We provide grants of between five and 25,000 US dollars to undertake projects in disaster risk management and climate change adaptation. And one of the things that we want to do is to see if within our, um, we are exploring or thinking about it, within a particular project, how we can support a community with, uh, by subsidizing or purchasing livelihood protection policies for that particular community. So where we're supporting a project focusing on say sustainable agriculture, would we then be able through that project to support policies purchasing policies under that project, LPP policies for that com particular community. Because the thing is with these microinsurance policies to make them viable, they require scale. And when you think of vulnerable groups in countries like let's say Jamaica, for example, would persons be interested in insurance? In fact, there is a demand for livelihood protection insurance in Jamaica, because we did meet with the farmers and fishers um, and they prefer to purchase livelihood protection than life insurance, for example, because they said, if I'm dead, I'm dead, but I prefer to protect my livelihood. Um, so yes, I mean, it's a great idea. It's something that we have been working on in terms of engaging more and more civil society organizations. Um, there, can I go ahead, Geneva, to respond to Ariel? Yes, yes, please proceed. Oh, well, okay, although I know there is no policy for eruptions, recent events in SDG 
has triggered research and some community based organizations and so many. Now would be an ideal for marketing and education. And one of the things we want to market, and I hope Ari can do that for us in St. Vincent, is the fact that person, organizations, CSOs, they have access to grants. We have a lot of grants that you can access. And um, we encourage the, these organizations and persons like you to make them aware of, of them. Thank you very much um, for that, the, all that insight. Thank you for the comprehensive um, response to the questions. Um, much appreciated, Ms. Emmanuel. Um, yes, I see Aria as well as thanking you as, um, in the chat. So thank you very much. Well, I would now announce that this is the end of the question and answer segment. It was quite an engaging segment and I would hand you all over to Krista now who will take over from here. All right, thank you, Geneva. Um, I just want to offer Dirk and Elizabeth the opportunity to add some closing remarks. Anything that they want to say to the group before they leave, I would just like to give you that opportunity before I close the session. Dirk, you could possibly get us started. No, ladies first. This, please. Can you repeat? Just one slightly distracting. Can you please repeat? Sorry, Elizabeth. Um, we're just giving some closing remarks, so I just wanted to give you the opportunity to say anything before you, uh, before you left the session. Oh no! I just want to thank the CPDC again, and I don't know if I said it this morning, but just to also be so willing to accommodate us. I know this particular um, event should have been held in March, and it, it was really interesting that you, you you were willing to shift it to accommodate us. So we thank you. I mean, we're always, always happy to share our message, um, to talk about CRIF, and we're really excited about microinsurance. So yes, we started off as a, you know, providing insurance at the sovereign level, but, you know, just being able to, to, to know that what you're doing is going to support people and people directly is something that we all work towards. I mean, we're all working towards, you know, leaving no one behind, thinking about the most vulnerable in our populations first. So very excited by the prospects of microinsurance, very interested, interested to see this project get to the scale at which we think it has to get to really benefit the people of the Caribbean. We are a best practice example for parametric insurance. I mean, we are the best parametric insurance facility sovereign level in the world. Um, we are considered a best practice. I think working with the Munich Climate Insurance Initiative, us working collectively, I think we want to be able to take another best practice to the rest of the world. So we are pulling out all stops to make sure that the LPP really gets the scale that, 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 that it needs and really gets to the people that need it. I think we will also play a fundamental role. I mean, this in what we're doing, you know, the, the partners in this project for private insurance companies, because the truth is our private insurance companies in the region really do not know how to interact with vulnerable persons. They don't. You know, it's ironic because some of the persons who actually work in these companies were vulnerable themselves before they were educated and can work in these nice, you know, companies. And um, we, we are providing them with access to new clients. And we think that this project would also build um, our private insurance companies throughout the region to be able to provide more. So by, we, we see this project as a means of also allowing vulnerable groups to increase their understanding of the financial landscape, the importance of the financial landscape. It will play a role in improving financial literacy. There is so much scope for microinsurance and really uplifting the lives and livelihoods of people across the Caribbean. We're very passionate about this project and we're very passionate about microinsurance and seeing it just rolled out throughout the Caribbean. So those are my closing remarks. Thank you. Uh, Dirk? 
Yeah, I, I just can say I'm very proud to be here, uh, that I had the opportunity to be here. I would like to thank you at CPDC, the whole team. Um, it was a great pleasure to be with my colleague, Liz Emanuel from CRIF SPC. And um, I would ask interested parties from this whole group, if you need our contact or my contact, please do not hesitate to ask Kristen and then we can make the link if, if you want to go further, if you have additional ideas or whatever, uh, it's, an, it's an open address and um, please feel free. So thank you again very much. And I report back to my team that is waiting for my impression and my impression is really great. Great to be with you, thank you. All right, thank you, Dirk for, and Elizabeth, for your closing remarks. And I would also like to draw your reference to the chat. There is a call for proposals available to all interested organizations from IC, ICII in Jamaica. Um, I would also like to draw reference to the question that started this round table discussion is, can the livelihood protection policy reduce the impact of natural disasters on vulnerable groups in the Caribbean? I think based on the presentations, we can say, yes, there is a space for the livelihood protection policy in terms of um, reducing these negative impacts on vulnerable populations. But we'll also like to thank Dirk from the MCIA team and Elizabeth from CRIF SBC for their informative presentations and their panel discussions today. I know we are slightly over time. Um, I would also like to thank the participants for coming out and sharing their support and engaging and interacting over this two hour um, consultation. I'd just like to wish everyone a happy and productive day as we go back into our um, usual settings of work. Um, thank you once again. And bye-bye. Thanks, Christian. Enjoy.